obese side. And this is actually a really healthy weight, so you can see. And the best way to handle them, around the back end and somewhere around the middle, and then let the front end do what it's going to do. But yeah, this is generally what you're looking at for an adult size short tail. How often do they eat? Um, when feeding, I usually do for the babies, I usually need to feed one appropriate meal, so about the size. I start them on adult mice, don't even bother with, unless I'm going to do fuzzy rats. Um, I do adult mice once every five to seven days, and then the older, once they hit about his size or this one size in here, once they get about this size, I'll switch them to once every 10 days or 10 to 14 days. And then my adults, I feed once every 14 days to 21 days. Still feed mice, so hmm? do you put them with rats? Oh yeah, I give them rats. I usually try and give them a meal that's, once they hit that size, I just give them large rats. That's yeah. it. One large rat or an extra large rat or extra extra, whichever. Yeah. The biggest ones you can find. I'll give them one every two to three weeks. So you want to go to the next one? Um, a lot of people, like I was saying earlier, uh, when they first started keeping blood pythons, they used to keep them like 95 degrees soaking wet because uh, they were like, oh, they come from the swamps, the swamps of Sumatra and Borneo, so it's really hot all the time, soaking wet, sitting in the swamp, whatever. Uh, now we found out that they actually do a lot better. I keep all of mine between 80 and 85 degrees at all times year round. Um, if you're going to do breeding and things, you can cool down, but 80 to 85 year round. I don't do nighttime drops. Um, but that's the best temperatures to keep them at. And then I usually just keep the large water dish. And if I see that they're going into shed, like I have one over there that's going into shed, I'll soak down the cage. That's the only time that I really like soak down the cage to make sure that they get enough humidity so that they shed all of their shed off. Um, because once they hit about four feet long, they usually have a little bit more difficulty, kind of like other big snakes with shedding, humidity, things like that. But what I generally do is I'll soak down the whole cage then once they've shed and gotten most of the shed off or all of the shed off, I'll just take all the newspaper out, all the substrate out, and put all fresh stuff in so they can start. And generally, when short tails shed, they'll also go to the bathroom. So once they get to about that size, you're probably going to find a nice big pile of shed and then a big pile of poop right next to it. Um, and also, just in general, like most snakes, you want to try and keep them individually. I generally don't mix two together unless it's for breeding purposes, uh, just a general rule. It's a lot harder when feeding. Blood pythons and short-tailed pythons have a extremely strong feeding response. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, if there is rodents in the room or in the area, a lot of the times they'll be right out, right at the side of the tub waiting for you to open it up because they know there's going to be food, even if you feed them outside of the cage. Um, so a lot of times when I tell people that if they're going to get into blood pythons or short-tailed pythons, have something with you. Like I usually use my hemostats, 18-inch hemostats or 24-inch hemostats. And when I open up the tub, if I'm going in for handling, just give them a tap or like push their head to the side gently and then go in. Or you can even hold the head to the side and then scoop with your other hand. Uh, I generally don't use hooks for short-tails just because they're sh so short. They don't really sit well on hooks. Um, if I do use hooks, it's just for tapping them, letting them know I'm not feeding them, and then I'm coming into the cage. Or if, they, if I have them in the adult size caging, I'll pull them to the side. Because as juveniles, I use the six core tubs, and then once they get a little bit larger than that, like about yearling size, I'll switch them into a 12 quart tub, which is about this big, probably bigger about that big, and then the 28 quart, like sweater tubs, and then 41 quart tubs, which are probably have about the same floor space as a 20 gallon, maybe a little bit more. And then eventually for my adults, I'll use, like you can see in this picture, or if you go back one, um, I use 74 quart underbed storage bins, which are like 45 inches long by 17 inches wide by 8 inches tall or so. Um, and those work. A lot of people use VE 175 tubs if you have money to do that sort of thing. Um, I build most of my own racks. So you can see this is a 12 quart uh, bin and that's a 41 quart bin. And generally what you want to do as a general guideline for bloods and short tails is that you want to have it so that the snake can stretch out at least 75% of its body across the cage at least one way. Um, with the short tails that's really important for our digestion. Since they don't go to the bathroom all that often, they digest everything, just about everything, except for the fur, all of it, they use everything. 
So a lot of times they'll spend, they'll be sitting, and if they're coiled up, they won't be digesting properly, stuff gets pushed to the side and whatnot. So you want to have a cage that they can at least stretch out about 75% of their body along the length of the cage. So as babies, I usually use the six quart bins, then switch them to 12, 28, and then eventually the 74 quarts. For a lot of my snakes, I used to do high boxes, and if they are problem feeders when you start out, I give them high boxes. It makes them feel more secure. Um, if that's still too big, you can use crumpled up newspaper and pack it into the cage, and they'll use that as a hiding. It usually makes them feel a lot more secure. And you can feed them better in that. Once they're eating and whatnot, once bloods and short tails have started eating, they generally don't stop. If they're in shed, they're eating. If they're breeding, they're eating. It doesn't really matter. I've only had a couple males go off eating once or two for two, three weeks during breeding season or two or three feeding periods and then they're right back on. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people like that about short tail pythons, but it can also be their downfall because it can make them really overweight. And that's what I was just getting to, feeding. Uh, generally what I do when feeding blood short tail pythons is that I will preset the room. So I feed all of mine frozen thawed. Everything I have is on frozen thawed. I don't feed anything live. Uh, it's a lot more dangerous to snakes once you get up to feeding rats. If you leave a rat in the cage, it can be dangerous. Uh, it can damage the snake. I don't want that. So it's also a lot more cost effective to feed them frozen thawed items. Uh, but generally, I try and pick out an item that is about as thick around as the snake, when they're small, under three or four feet long. And then once they get up to a, like adult size, four and a half foot to five foot, I'll just give them a, a large rat or an extra large rat, the biggest ones that they get. Um, I'll feed them once of those every two to three weeks. And as you can see, that's actually, I have given uh, a few of my adults guinea pigs. Usually when I do that, I won't feed them again for another month. It's like six weeks. I'll usually wait. And that's perfectly fine. Just so you want to keep an eye on their weight. Like you can see, this one down here is one that I had had. Uh, it's actually up with my friend Ken. And she is really overweight like I can't stress how overweight that snake is and that was when I first got her and right now she's back looking more like this one over here she's down to a more healthy weight it's really really easy to put weight and size on a blood python it is really hard to take it off and I can't stress that enough because a lot of people get into oh man I can feed it and blood and short tail pythons will eat and eat and eat so if you feed them every three days they're probably going to eat every three days and that will lead to obesity, and it's just, it'll shorten the life of your snake. And I generally advise against people feeding them really heavily. Um, if you're going to do a heavy feeding schedule, I say for, do five to seven days for the juveniles, and then you can do 10 days to 14 days for the adults if you really want to make sure they're getting food all the time. But exercise is the key. Once you get, if you get one that's overweight, take it out, handling it. Like if you take a blood python out and you sit down on your couch and put it on your lap, it's gonna sit in your lap. They're probably not gonna do a lot of exploring. They're uh, sit and wait predators. So they will generally in the wild, they'll find a nice little area of leaves and they'll just hide underneath it and wait for the food to come to them. They generally don't go out looking for food. So if you put them on your lap and they find someplace where they're comfortable, then they're probably not gonna move around a lot. Um, that's really good for when you're handling them. It's not really good when they're supposed to be active and losing a little bit of weight. So if you if you get one that's a little overweight, taking it out every day or every two days, making sure you handle it a lot, making sure it's getting exercise, put it down, take it outside or something like that um, is the key to kind of getting the weight off. And they can lose weight, it's just a lot of work. All right, and these are uh, just a general outline of some of the Borneo short tails that you can get in captivity. Uh, down here, this is from one of my friends, Chris Kopecki. He's working on, this is actually a brand new kind of stripe line. It's just getting out there right now. Uh, the, I think he's calling it the skunk line. Uh, it's kind of, I've got a couple that are kind of the same genetics going on. Um, and they're producing these really crazy stripe, like these are called generally super stripes. Uh, VPI originated them. The, with the tri-striping, you'll see that they got the one general stripe down the middle and then they got two stripes down the sides. And this is also another variation of the super stripe. Uh, but this one came from Matt Minitola. And then generally, normal Borneo short tail pythons look like this one right here and that one right there. You can see that they kind of got that brown, kind of silvery base color, and they got a little bit of white in the tail. 
and they've got the kind of peachish colored head or like a tan colored head. Um, this is one is called a het ultra bright. And ultra brights are a mutation that turns the snake basically platinum, like golden walnut color and lots of like the t light tans, cream color all over. And it also works on reducing the patterns. Um, and that one is actually head ultra bright and the super form, the ultra brights are super reduced. So if you want to go to the next one, I think I have. All right, I've got different types. Okay, these, uh, this is another type of stripe. And generally when you have ones that have a stripe like that, if you breed them together, you'll get what are called super stripes, the ones with the tri-striping down the back. Um, down here, this is a marble or a, a granite super stripe. You can see that it's got all this white speckling along the sides. That's characteristic of the uh, marbling gene. And that is generally a recessive gene, but they also have one that is a codominant. There's two different strains that kind of got mixed together back when they first started breeding them, so it's kind of hard to tell now uh, which one's which, but they generally look about the same. This one is definitely a recessive. This one is by Rich Crowley, and he is actually bred three generations out of this, and that is actually a sibling. So he's crossing these granites together, and he's getting ultra brights out of the thing. So a lot of the, the blood pythons, the morphs, are set and straight, kind of like ball pythons. You breed a het to a het, you get this. You get breed a visual to a visual, you can get crosses or super forms. With the Borneos, there's a couple that work like the recessives, and then there's other things that pop out of nowhere and we have no idea what's going on. So we're still working on kind of figuring out what's going on. And then this one up here is kind of like, a, it's called a cookies and cream kind of morph. Uh, they are really black, dark, dark black, and then whites all in the uh, dorsal and then they have a really pronounced yellow coloring that comes in as they mature. And this is actually what that cookies and cream looks like a little bit later. You can see that it's got that dark, dark black and then a lot of the white. Um, and then that's a head ultra up on the top. This is actually what you can produce from the ultra gene. This is a striped ultra that is uh, courtesy of Nick Botini from uh, Cold Blooded Earth. He's one of my good friends. And then uh, this one is actually produced by Keith McPeak. That's a ghost stripe. So they bred that super stripe gene into the ultra bright gene, and they're getting more and more crazy white patterning going on. Skunk line stripes. Actually, when uh, Jason Chapman, who does hellbent reptiles, he's up in Maine, when he bred that uh, skunk line stuff to one of his other stripes, he produced this, which we have no idea what it is. It's brand new. It's the only one that's ever been produced. He's working on trying to produce more like it. Um, but I've got one of the siblings to that one, the male that I took out earlier. And so we're trying to figure out what's going on with all that. Still trying to work it out. But there's only a few people that are working with that right now. And then this is some, uh, an ultra bright. That was produced from super stripes that are head ultra bright. Um, and that's produced by Matt Minitola. And he's been producing animals that look like this the last two seasons. And it's just a lot of people haven't seen these really cool, crazy morphs that are coming out because it's just, there's not that popularity out there that ball pythons have, and the word's not out as much. I feel like uh, short tail pythons and bloods, once people start seeing all the crazy stuff that you can get with them, they're gonna become a lot more popular in the next couple of years. And then, that's that uh, granite stuff that I was telling you about. You can see the heavy speckling, the white and black speckling on the sides. And then they generally have like a walnut color, and it's really blushed out in the back. And then this is another one of Matt Minitola's animals that is produced from his head ultra type stuff. So we're not really sure what's going on with them. We're still trying to figure that out. We're kind of like in the infancy, like when people first started getting in piebald ball pythons and things like that, when they're breeding them, it's, like, it's coming out all this stuff. But there's a lot more genes going on, we think, than with just the head to head type stuff. And this is also a, a super stripe that came from Matt Minitola. And that's Minit Matt Minitola from Philly Herb Culture. All right, now I'm going to talk about blood pythons. A lot of people say that they're Sumatran blood pythons or Malaysian blood pythons. Um, they stopped importing Malaysian blood pythons, I want to say about 10 years ago or a little bit more than that. So generally when you see little hatchling, captive hatch uh, red blood pythons, generally they're Sumatran locale or they're not really locale specific. Um, but that is one that I actually had a long time ago. And then this is one that is a, these are generally Sumatrans. And then this one right here at the bottom 
is one that I didn't bring today because she's in the shed, and immediately when I put her into the bag, she peed everywhere. So I was like, you know what? You can stay at home. But that's a Banka Island locality, and they're kind of known for having a lot more crazy contrast colors going on. I got that one from bloodpythons.com, and they're actually one of the few people that are like working on breeding locale-specific bloods and short tails. Um, so these uh, start out kind of like an orange, kind of like you get the regular blood pythons. And as they mature, they get really intense red coloration. It's about two, two and a half years old right now. And that's generally when bloods start to pick up their color a lot. Like when you see them as babies, they're like, oh, it's a little brown orange snake. And then once they hit two, three years old, they start really picking up intensity and color. And that's when they turn into like red animals, kind of like this. And this one's from Kara Norris. And that one is actually there's Rolo Loco, not with us anymore, but that's one of the nicer uh, red blood pythons that you can see. You can get those really nice, deep, rich red coloration in them. And I'm going to start talking to you guys a little bit about the red blood python morphs. Um, up top, these are T-negative albinos. So like you'd see a regular albino ball python, uh, those are considered T-negative which stands for tyrosinase, which is uh, kind of an acid that gives melanin. Uh, so we get in the T-negatives this really crazy white tail, all the white markings in it, and then this, when they're young, they kind of look a little bit like the other types of albinos, but as they mature, they start to get this really intense red coloration that comes in, or, or orange, kind of like a fire truck. Really starting to pick up right now. A lot of people are kind of figuring out about them, uh, picking them up. A lot of people are bring it, breeding them more. Um, down here, this is known as a batik, and that's got that. It's got the typical kind of like crazy erratic patterning going on. A lot of speckling in the sides, and when you breed two of those together, you get an uh, animal that's like kind of like a tan color, almost like the color of the walls, almost, and they get like a black black head, but. 